Yeah. All right, everyone. It's 9.01, so we may as well get started. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks, Andrew. Uh, welcome to our talk. Um, yeah. Right. There we go. Okay, so we're going to give a, a little talk here called From Black Box to Open Book Transitioning to Open Solutions Governments Can Control. My name is Sean Lahane, and my co-presenter is Andrew Mallis. Uh, before we get started, we've got to thank the sponsors. Um, you know, this is a great event, and thankfully it's free for everyone, all these wonderful sponsors. Okay, so who are we? My name is Sean Lahane. Uh, I'm a senior program manager here at Kalamuna. I've got about 15 years experience delivering complex digital products for all sorts of sectors, higher ed, government, entertainment, not-for-profits. Also, I'm a cat guy, and uh, in my spare time, I like to write weird horror stories. So, Andrew? My name's Andrew Malis. I'm the CEO of Kalamuna. I uh, have over 20 years' experience uh, in leadership and working in collaboration with colleges, universities, uh, governments, and community organizations. Um, I'm really invested in building strong partnerships, not only you know, with our clients, but also uh, meaningful experiences for the team here at Kalamuna. Um, Kalamuna is a digital agency. We're focused on the public good, and uh, our, all our clients are mission-driven. A uh, considerable portion of those are in the state and local government spaces. Uh, also, I forage for mushrooms and uh, make my own hot sauces. Okay, so what are we going to talk about? Uh, today we're going to talk about digital transformation, specifically strategies that we as program managers and digital leaders can follow to adapt our practices so that we can deliver open source software solutions for government agencies. We're going to look at three things. We're going to look at common reasons to undertake digital transformation, uh, then we're going to look at major challenges in doing so in a government context, and finally, how program managers can tailor their program approach to maximize success. Before we get started, oh, there we go, thank you. Before we get started, um, I just want to get a feel for the room. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a couple of questions and clap twice if it applies to you. So who here works in government? Nice. <laughs> uh, who works at a digital services agency or consultancy? Good, good. So for those in government, clap your hands again if you're in the process of a digital transformation or modernization. Excellent. And then everyone, clap your hands if you work, uh, or if in your work you regularly use a piece of proprietary software that is difficult to manage, uh, modernize, or adapt. Everyone, great. So this talk should be of interest then. Uh, we, because we all have systems and tools that to one extent or another are not doing what we need them to do, or, as is very common, we've changed what it is that we need them to do. And sometimes they've been around longer than us. And we, as people and users of these tools, we've just learned to adapt our process to meet the, uh, meet the tools where they are. Basically, we've lowered our expectations. But eventually, change comes to all systems. The weight of mounting user needs and shifting requirements, or the ever-creeping uh, entropy, will set into the software and at a time, at times, it, you know, it will require change. But change is difficult and expensive. It can be scary, and it comes with a tons of risk. Uh, but it doesn't have to. It doesn't have to be any of these things, and that's what this talk is about. So what motivates us to undertake digital transformation? There are a ton of reasons, and here are just uh, some of the common ones that we find all the time. So first off, you may be saddled with a black box application in the system that is no longer compliant with the rest of the system. Your product may be built with deprecated code. You may not be able to get support for it anymore. This could put you into a high risk situation, especially if, you're a system, if your system is a utility grade system or comes with regulatory obligations or uptime, that sort of thing. It could start acting, as far as you can tell, uh, given your lack of support and it's you know the deprecated nature of the product unpredictably or unreliably leading to extended downtime and costly on-call support you may have no backup plan no disaster recovery plan in place and related to all this you may not even own the product so even if you wanted to or could go ahead and try to upgrade it or modernize it uh, you wouldn't even be allowed to all of these scenarios were in play to one extent or another 
uh, for one of our government clients, which led us to undertake a complex digital project, digital transformation project. The 5 and one San Francisco Bay system operated by the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, the MTC, encompasses mainly the nine Bay Area counties covering approximately 21,000 miles of local streets and highways. The 511 system is one of the most sophisticated and heavily used traveler information systems, ATISs, uh, in the nation. The MTC operates 511.org, a major real-time resource for the 7 million plus commuters and travelers in the Bay Area. Now, the most important part of the system is the real-time data pulled from various feeds, both internal to the MTC and external to it, showing issues, incidents, alerts, construction, et cetera, et cetera, things that impact your commute. It's designed to be a utility-grade tool for commuters, and this API proxy application um, basically aggregates real-time traffic and transit information from 27, I think it's actually now 29 uh, distinct agencies in the Bay Area and delivers it to multiple consumers including Google Maps, Apple Maps, uh, Bing, and of course the 501.org website itself. But this API proxy system that ingests all this data, manipulates it, caches it, and serves it to users was failing regularly. And the outages uh, that we were experiencing were getting longer and they were costing more to remediate. It was a custom built application, <coughs> excuse me, using deprecated Python and Angular. It had become a black box system because its documentation wasn't updated, it wasn't comprehensive, it was riddled with tech debt, uh, it was nearly a decade old when we took it over, and it had changed numerous times over the years, new features being added, but never really, old features were never really taken away, they were just sort of hidden from the front end, so it was a gnarled mess. Uh, basically, it had become a legacy nightmare, and we were responsible for maintaining it. Both the MTC and Kalamuna felt uh, that the risk exposure in continuing to maintain this black box uh, was far too high, so we had to replace it. Now, the MTC had basic requirements going into this work that basically corresponded to the problems with the existing system. So the new system had to be well-supported, well-documented, um, uptime guaranteed, it had to be expandable, and it had to basically do all of the things that the old system had done. Great requirement. But then lastly, um, it had to be cloud-based and it had to be open source. So over to Andrew. Now the MTC is a big proponent of open source and uh, the 511 site has been running on Drupal since 2018 and their open data program precedes that. Most government agencies, uh, even forward-thinking ones like the MTC, still mostly follow traditional practices in program management. Some claim to be agile uh, but are bound by antiquated procurement processes that are intended for building physical things like bridges, not involving digital products. Agile ultimately is a framework, and not a process, and it needs to be adapted to people, context, and desired outcomes. This can be challenging in any context and sometimes more so in a government context. Um, we'll talk a bit later about how open source software is being embraced by governments around the world, uh, but for now it's good to know that it's not mandated at the federal or state level, which means every agency is approaching open source uh, more or less in its own way. Failure is a known problem in delivering di digital products for government, uh, open source or not, and uh, numerous studies and reports show that large-scale digital transformation projects both government and in the private sector fail to meet their desired outcomes, anything, um, or, or, their, or their budget uh, goals. Uh, we're here to help you from becoming a statistic. Uh, interestingly, in 2020, uh, the Standish Group re uh, released a study uh, that demonstrated that agile product products are, projects are three times less likely, uh, sorry, more likely to succeed than waterfall projects and about uh, waterfalls about twice uh, as likely uh, to fail. So uh, these are harmonized stats for all uh, types. About 70% of digital projects that are greater than a million dollars fail. Um, about 13 of projects above six million dollars succeed and 30% of all digital transformations succeed. We have some, some sources for you down there. But Canada isn't uh, immune to digital failure uh, digital transformation failures. Um, you know, I think we've all 
heard a lot about healthcare.gov, it's often touted. These are some maybe lesser known uh, examples to, to you we thought we'd share. Uh, Phoenix is, uh, is, is currently in the, you know, in the news still. Uh, it's a custom built federal payment system. Um, a big payroll application uh, built by uh, IBM and, and CGI. Um, after eight years, its initial $300 million budget, it ballooned to about $4 billion. And uh, the worst part of it is that there are about 400,000 backlog payments in the system uh, every month. And uh, that's uh, causing distress for federal employees in particular. In uh, 2019, the government was forced to distribute about $4.3 million of compensation in the form of, of, PT, of hours and PTO that amounted to about $179,000, 179 days of leave, fairly considerable. Um, population of Canada is a little smaller. Uh, Arrive Can is, uh, if you've traveled uh, between the US and Canada or, or elsewhere, uh, you may be familiar with the, M the MPC app, Mobile Passport Control, that the US has. It facilitates travel between custom, uh, in customs. Uh, the original program for this budget in Canada was uh, $80,000, which uh, is <laughs> probably under budgeted for any program or, or a custom uh, product. Uh, but it's ballooned to nearly $60 million today, and uh, the procurement and management practices are being examined and investigated by multiple levels of law enforcement uh, due to concerns of gross negligence and, and potentially even fraud. Um, so they're about 750% over budget at this point. And um, still, you know, not really working too well. So, um, why do digital transformations fail? For as many reasons as there are to undertake a digital transformation, there are as many reasons why they fail. Um, let's see. So, at the program level, there is often a lack of cohesive vision and deep understanding of the needs of users, internal and customer. And there's a disconnect between what the organization wants to do and what users actually need it to do. Uh, two, like in many government and enterprise organizations, there's resistance to change, coupled with a lack of uh, a strong change management plan, mostly deriving from number one above. Uh, three, when the need to reconsider and reprioritize arise, uh, arises, which you know, we all know occurs on large scale projects, organizational leadership often isn't equipped to make smart pivots, uh, nor are they inclined to. And uh, number four, this is a big one, civil servants and leadership often are not the best equipped to make technology decisions. As a result, it's normal to contract with suppliers and vendors or system integrators. But because of the lack of internal technology management expertise, it becomes much harder to oversee outside vendors. And outside vendors are not always aligned with the goals of the organization as you know, their priority is to sell and implement their own products. So definitely, uh, not aligned here on, uh, on values. And then lastly, uh, as said throughout this list, government organizations, organizations excuse me, <clears throat> often just can't have all the most trained technology people. You know, it's not feasible. Why does failure matter? Uh, well, it matters because the loss of faith in digital systems can lead to a loss of faith in government. And uh, reports of taxpayer dollars being wasted uh, makes government agencies more cautious to undertake desperately needed digital transformation. So it's up to us as digital leaders to do everything we can to improve delivery for our government agency clients. Uh, I'll shift it back to Sean and talk more about how we adapted our program approach for 511. Great, thank you. So this isn't an introduction <coughs> excuse me, to program management or project management. Uh, instead, I'm gonna walk through three areas to focus on. Uh, as you develop your program uh, to give you the best opportunity to deliver the highest value outcomes. Now, uh, what I'm going to go through in these slides, I'm going to speak to program managers and agents in consultancies like Calabuna, but it applies just as equally to the government equivalents, uh, the government counterparts. And uh, you know what we're talking about here is to improve us as consultants. Uh, and these are the kinds of characteristics and traits that you should be looking for uh, as government. So I've broken it down into sort of three areas to focus on. Uh, the first is foster a partnership. Uh, second, make considered technology choices. And three, develop a growth mindset. 
So what do I mean by foster partnership? Uh, these are some strategies to help transition you from vendors to partners. And why does this matter? Well, because partners are trusted. Uh, you're more willing to accept risks with a partner. You're more willing to take risks with a partner. You're more willing to listen. You're more engaged. For uh, making considered technology choices, there are a lot of different ways to make technology decisions. Some more basic or superficial ways can lead to costly mistakes. So I'll talk about some ways to alleviate uh, the, or elevate rather, the decision-making process to hopefully lead to more successful outcomes. And then lastly, uh, developing a growth mindset. We need to demonstrate how our projects, though discrete and finite, roll up into a bigger picture for our clients. We need to show through success after success after success how we can achieve those bigger, longer term objectives. Uh, these are, you know, this isn't waterfall, these are not sequential. Uh, uh, they definitely have feedback loops that you know, grow and evolve over time. Okay, so getting into the first one, fostering partnership. I call it foster partnership because partnership doesn't just happen overnight. You know, it, it grows. You may become a partner, uh, you know, with a couple of signatures on a piece of paper, but partnership takes time and effort to build. So the first point is to engage the full community of stakeholders. Start by identifying the broader set of stakeholders impacting the project, beyond just the PMs and POs directly uh, overseeing the particular engagement you're involved in. Like in many government agencies, the technology ecosystem is often fractured and managed by nearly isolated groups of consultants and subconsultants. We need to identify them, talk to them, engage them, find out what their stake, who their stakeholders are, find out what their needs are, talk to their users. Uh, two, the agency may in fact uh, have different PMs sort of overseeing each relationship. And it may make perfect sense on paper to do it this way because on paper they sort of seem isolated and such. Uh, however, in this kind of situation, no one, no one in, the, in the ecosystem is going to have a full, deep understanding of all the different parts of the system or the forest itself, right? So, um, and since you know, every, every system in an ecosystem is going, over time, is going to have micro improvements, micro uh, feature enhancements, so on and so forth, uh, if no one is maintaining that full picture, then the likelihood that somewhere down the line someone's random system is going to impact your system in a way that you haven't predicted uh, increases exponentially. So if a true digital landscape-wide stakeholder analysis hasn't been completed, take charge of making it yourself. You may get some pushback, uh, but use your negotiation and persuasion skills to show the value of this for not only your program, but for the agency, the wider agency uh, as a whole. Continually engaging the wide community of stakeholders, listening and sharing concerns, issues, plans, will do a couple of things. It'll breed trust and goodwill, and it'll just make your program better. The second point here is about uh, user needs over technical requirements. Now it's pretty easy with large scale IT projects to get subsumed by requirements, to let technology drive the conversation. We need to always remind our partners that technology is there to serve the needs of users, not the other way around. So we delve deep into user research to identify the real needs, goals, jobs to be done, you know, et cetera, of the people who are using the technology at every stage. You know, from the IT department that has to configure things on servers somewhere, to the internal teams that need to be trained uh, to use the system, all the way down to like the end users who basically just need the system to work, to do what it needs to do. So user needs in an agile sense become the bulk of the true high-level business rules uh, and requirements of the system. So we work with stakeholders to itemize every user type and every user goal uh, that you know, we can think of and our clients can think of. Every single one gets documented. Uh, they get scored and they get prioritized. We usually, obviously, can't serve every type and every goal, uh, of course, but this way from the start, we know we're backburnering some, okay? Documenting and storing them in a log doesn't cast them aside. We can add them to a future roadmap. So, heaven forbid, you know, halfway through the implementation, someone pops up and says, you know, we, oh, we need this requirement to be met for this deprioritized user type. Uh, we can take the conversation back to, you know, where we all decided that some deprioritized group is going to be dealt with later. 
Uh, and then lastly, once gathered and established, we examine our options for how to actually implement a technical solution. Now let's talk about risk. We have to share risk management. All too often, risk identification and analysis is done superficially in the RFP and bidding process and then not followed up on. Or conversely, it's done comprehensively once at the beginning of a project and then not followed up on. Also, too often, it's done in isolation just by us, by the consultants. Um, you know, we're asked to provide a risk assessment to our clients, and then you know, it's one and done. It's like a deliverable. Uh, but the problem is this creates anxiety. It can lead to people withholding or downplaying risks because they don't want to look bad by sharing certain items. Even really prominent risks uh, often get overlooked. Two very common risks that should appear on any risk register are uh, team turnover, the likelihood of team turnover, uh, maternity leave, paternity leave. You know, take any project or program that's going to last over a year, and you should have a risk of team turnover. I know in a lot of agencies, that's like 10% uh, that happens. Uh, and it's pretty easy to mitigate these things. It's pretty easy to document them, but a lot of people just don't want to say that that's, that can happen. Um, another point here is, how many people have heard of positive risks? Yes, okay, well done, entering the room and putting your hand up. Uh, yeah, positive risks, that's an actual thing. Um, this is basically, uh, well, think about a risk as anything that can impact the successful delivery of a, of a project, right? So an example of a positive risk in like the construction industry is your permits could arrive early, which never happens, but it could arrive early, which means you could start you know, some other phase of your building program earlier. So basically, positive risks, positive risks become opportunities in a SWOT analysis. So you gotta document those as well. Um, yeah, because it's really, you know, it's our goal when I'm looking at risk analysis and risk management is we gotta be doing everything we can to minimize the likelihood of, of negative risks and maximize the likelihood of positive risks. So the last thing I want to share here about uh, risk management is the need to share this process with agency partners. If you're open and upfront and critical in your thinking, your partners will be impressed. Why? Because that's integrity and character, that that's what you know, they're impressed by. This will lead also hopefully to your partners being more open with you and more reflective. I know I can't tell you how many times in a in, you know, consultancy role uh, we get clients that just agree all the time to, uh, you know, they're going to provide feedback and approval within a week. They never question it, and it never happens. And so timelines are just instantly thrown out because of it. But, you know, if you're sharing this sort of process right from the start, and you're being open and honest and upfront with your agency partners, you're going <coughs> to encourage them to be open to, and you're going to get a more, uh, a more robust risk analysis done. Uh, and then you're going to do it you're going to revisit it over time as you know risks the likelihood decreases over time of certain risks new risks are always emerging so on and so forth and and ironically is it ironically or coincidentally uh, as you add more risks to a risk register the impact of risks can decrease um, which is a wonderful thing so by establishing this sort of shared ownership and risk management uh, as I say, it's going to build trust and reduce the impact of these things that will, some variety of them, will materialize. Doing these will help establish your partnership right from the start on firm footing with a shared vision of success. It will also help break down some of the client-vendor dichotomy or divisions that, uh, you know, that unhealthy relationship uh, that lead directly to unrealistic expectations, which leads to a lack of trust, low morale, low excitement, budget overruns, and overall program dissatisfaction. So a key part of establishing and championing this shared vision, especially one that includes planned investment in open source solutions, is knowing the landscape. So you can help navigate the client through the uncertainties along the way. Open source is it's a, big, a big thing. There will be resistance to change at the agency. There'll be resistance against using some framework or technology that isn't coming from some well-known brand name. It's safe. When IBM gives you a quote, that sounds safer than perhaps a much lower quote from something you've never heard of. So it's important that we continue to champion OSS through all levels of communication, <coughs> excuse me, to continually reassure that 
we're on this track together. So, you know, we're about to talk about America, but you know, around the world, uh, some recent things. Switzerland, for instance, has just mandated that all government applications have to be open source. Um, Germany is doing uh, doing the same. They're migrating everyone off of Microsoft to Linux or Linux. Um, and the EU, as like an organizational federation, uh, is doing a lot to push this sort of agenda across all of its member states. Now, <clears throat> here in the United States, there hasn't been the same sort of federally coordinated approach to open source software, uh, but we are moving in that direction. For instance, the White House released a formal strategic plan around improving the security of open source solutions. The GSA is working to achieve 100% open source across its agency, and that agency in particular oversees 18F, the US, the U.S. Digital Core, U.S. Digital Service, all of which help other government agencies navigate and develop open source solutions wherever possible. CMS.gov, uh, the website for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, which I really think should just be like redirected to Drupal or WordPress, but whatever, uh, launched the first open source program office in the federal government. Uh, some of the projects here on the right uh, are all publicly available open source projects run by a variety of government agencies, mostly centered around you know, big data, library science, that sort of thing. So there is widespread desire on the part of governments globally and here in the U.S. to adopt open source frameworks and technologies. We're getting there. It's just taking longer and is more uniquely challenging here in America. So that takes me to making considered technology choices. Because there are so many different ways to leverage open source to implement basically any tech solution, including this API gateway project we did for the MTC, we need to review our technical requirements across the board in light of the user research we do to create a more robust set of requirements for the digital products we build. And to create a set of criteria by which we can evaluate the different technical options we can pursue. When we do this, when we prioritize users, the a priori technical requirements that we were handed in the beginning of any project get refined, and we can create a more complete 360 view uh, for our requirements traceability matrix that better ties together development efforts to user functionality, um, features, user types, user goals, satisfaction. Remember that we started looking at the full digital ecosystem back when we start uh, engaging the client's various stakeholder groups. We have little to no control over other systems in the ecosystem, but we do have the ability to persuade and influence. So, um, you know, just jumping back to this MTC example, we had initial high level requirements that basically said the system had to do everything the other one did except better and not have any problems. Uh, that's fair, but after going through exercises focused on user needs and really looking at the risks and roadmaps for ourselves, our partners, our partners' partners. And we actually broke it down and evolved a much more comprehensive set of uh, requirements. Uh, these, are some key, these are key criteria that we look at. So knowing which criteria to prioritize when evaluating technology solutions, how to score each, and how much weight to give each criteria, it's the fun problem of project program management. Uh, and it's going to be unique, obviously, to any, any project or any program that you're running. Too often we make unconsidered decisions based solely on like the classic uh, constraints, you know, cost. You know, what's the cheapest way to deliver it? Scope. What's going to give me the most features and timeline? Obviously, everything has to be done as soon as possible. But you know, if we actually orient uh, decision making around these kinds of principles, we end up ignoring the users that the system is meant to serve. So um, I'll talk very, very quickly about some of these criteria, but. Uh, just at a high level, this is a ranked priority list. So, you know, um, basically top to bottom is what we consider to be more important uh, going all the way down. And what you see on the screen here is uh, really just representative scoring. I just wanted to show the example that you can score uh, based on number systems, you know, zero to 10, uh, high, medium, low, you know, whatever. <clears throat> whatever you, you want to do to, um, to evaluate. Same with dollar figures. Uh, but in the end, though, you need to normalize all this uh, to create an actual scale that you can compare. Uh, and that's, that's what we did. Um, so we looked at, for our particular pro project, we looked at a variety of vendors. Um, 
And we also considered custom. We considered, you know, we're technologists. What if we just built this whole thing from scratch ourselves rather than going uh, to a SaaS solution? And, and in the end, that was not the best decision to do. <laughs> Um, in the end, we ended up going with uh, a product called Tyke, um, and Tyke is a universal SaaS API management tool, um, and it gave us everything that we needed. We could fully customize it to meet our needs. It also comes with support tiers, a strong UI for you know, non-developers like me to log in for reporting, metrics, etc., and no fixed contracts, so we could literally take the code base that we built uh, we built a pond and move it in-house if we ever wanted to, which was a great selling feature uh, for the MTC because it helps maintain their digital sovereignty. And also, I just want to quickly highlight that, uh, you know, Tyke, I'd never heard of Tyke. Tyke was not the forerunner when we started. When we started this program, everyone that we spoke to just had a couple of big names that we obviously would consider. Um, and perhaps if we had looked at just cost or scope or timeline, we would have gone somewhere else. But because we looked at the, a more robust set of criteria, this, this product emerged, this organization emerged, and it's really been a great, uh, a great fit for us and for our client. So this model of OSS SaaS solution is very popular. Uh, Andrew, you want to speak about these? Yeah, and it, it was familiar to us as well. The Tyke is built on open source technologies, and they put over top of it a layer, a presentation layer and, and support uh, that's you know proprietary to them. It's much like we do in the Drupal universe, where we combine uh, freely and open available tools, and then we develop a custom theme or some aspects of those programs that might be proprietary for a, a client. Open source uh, doesn't necessarily mean that all aspects of your system are open source. Uh, that's a decision a government agency can make. And in the case of MTC. Um, you know, there's a, a data pipeline that anyone can consume. Uh, however, the code uh, that's creating that pipeline isn't necessarily available to everyone. These models were familiar to us many years ago. We released a product called Calibox, which was a command line utility. And then we built a front end layer, a graphical user interface for it. Uh, that is now known as, uh, as Lando. Um, but it allowed for us to have a freely available uh, framework others could build upon, but still retain you know, a part of it uh, that then uh, was made unique. So we felt really comfortable entering into this space. Yeah. OK, so um, the last sort of area that I want to quickly touch on, which is uh, developing a growth mindset. So with all this in mind, um, you know, talk about tech. We got to work, and uh, we built the thing, and we launched it, and it was absolutely perfect, on budget, on time, no problems whatsoever. And I'm obviously kidding when I say that. Uh, there were challenges. You know, it was more difficult to build than we thought. Uh, it would be. It ended up going slightly over budget. It ended up going uh, launching a bit late. We had about a, a two-week delay that became a month and a half delay because it happened right before a holiday break. Blah blah blah. But these are standard, very common challenges when delivering any new product. Uh, however, we kept going back to first principles. We kept returning to our shared vision. And you know, we, uh, we kept hammering back the value that's being created and deprioritizing this notion of, uh, uh, of success is you know, hitting an SPI or a CPI of one. Anything over budget is a failure. That sort of mentality is, uh, is not right. Um, there are fluctuations that happen in any project, in any program, and it's up to us to manage those fluctuations with our clients so that they're continually looking at the bigger picture with us. They say that courage isn't the absence of fear, uh, but rather it's doing the right thing despite there being fear, and that's, that's something that we have to consider. All projects face challenges, big and small, and it's how we manage uh, to still deliver the outcomes despite these challenges that matter. So though technology and user needs may seem like they're constantly evolving uh, and constantly changing, these are not excuses to avoid documentation. There's a common misconception amongst people that Agile lets you off the hook here. It doesn't. Uh, though it's true that we look to craft and share you know, documentation that is barely sufficient, it is still sufficient. Um, it has to be kept up to date and shared and understood. And this takes real time and real commitment. 
Strong, readable architectural documentation, user manuals, diagrams, and the like allows new people to be added to the system over time. And with these new people come their new ideas and expertise. And uh, this allows it to flourish. Focus on seeking broader team training. Disseminate this documentation to the widest possible team of stakeholders. This will also help ensure that other vendors and partners are aware of how your system is working. Uh, so when they go to do their own transformations and modernizations in the future, it's the single strongest defense against a system falling into disrepair. Now, it's critically important that you continue to demonstrate the value of the work you've done and how it contributes positively to your partner's future roadmap. It's not the number of features developed or tickets closed, per se, but the amount of use the end users are going to get out of your system. That's what, uh, that's what matters, and that's what you've got to frame uh, your customer or your client's perspective on your work. Demonstrate the value of further investment. Agile's focus is on delivering usable software as quickly as possible and growing it over time with input from real users. Early wins lead to more wins because they improve confidence and engender trust. Showing how time and money along the way pr produce real value is the key to future growth. So uh, by focusing on these three them thematic areas in the program over the last uh, three and a half years, um, the program has evolved and MTC's you know, reality is more closely aligned with their perspective on embracing open source and making those types of programs r real. And uh, more and more of their programs have moved towards an agile methodology. Uh, the success of this particular product has given them confidence to undertake other aspects of digital transformation. Um, the, we've, uh, we're currently undertaking a comprehensive redesign of the website itself, so the front end and the interfaces that the public is going to have more, uh, of, uh, more connection with. And um, our championship and continued um, expression of how users and their goals are, are a driving force um, has created greater confidence in investing in user research and because the MTC has seen the direct value uh, that provides in helping carve out a more comprehensive and useful roadmap. And uh, our efforts to uh, prioritize their digital ecosystem needs has increased trust and the, the mapping of that overall digital space has allowed MTC to think in uh, gr with greater confidence about how their efforts are fitting into the larger roadmap of other digital transformation projects across the transit and transportation spaces in the Bay Area. Um, we recently got the green light to uh, uh, undertake a complementary project which migrates a key component of their website away from a reliance on uh, Google Maps uh, towards OpenStreetMap, which is a, an open source project. I think it just celebrated its maybe 18th, 20th anniversary, 20th anniversary this year. Uh, so really mature, um, an amazing community in its own right. Our uh, results have uh, spoken for themselves, I think, and uh, the, the long-term partnership uh, that we've forged has created greater appetite to invest you know, in, in open source across, across the agency, and we hope these stories will propagate into uh, other aspects of the work that MTC is doing. All right, so let's uh, bring it all back together with uh, some summaries, and uh, we'll have a few minutes, a few moments for questions. Still, yes, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so I hope everyone's gotten uh, at least a, a couple of good nuggets out of this. We want to leave you with five attitudes or mindsets, perspectives, whatever you want to call it, uh, that you can take away and start applying right now in your program. Uh, first, many of the reasons we've seen large projects fail tie directly to digital partners dropping the ball and failing to live up to our responsibility as digital leaders. It's not the fault of bureaucracies that they don't always have top-notch digital talent. That's why they hire us. <laughs> Two, we need to focus our project management and program management on these higher order efforts, such as building partnership, trust, and accountability in the program. We definitely still do the technical PMing work of budgets and tasks and all that sort of stuff, but that is secondary uh, and becomes a lot easier when you've got a trusting partner. Three, put the needs of the users first. The right technology will become more apparent when you do. Four, from a technical perspective, um, you know, in particular, we need to push, nudge, persuade everyone to be considering at all times the full digital ecosystem 
uh, when doing a digital transformation. Doesn't mean that we're replacing everything or even responsible for everything today, but we need to have a view on it to be able to build the most complete roadmap possible. And that's really what we're selling. We're selling the vision of the roadmap and to, to our partners. And five, speaking of these most uh, strategic decisions, our goal needs always, to be, needs always to be delivering high value, fast, sequentially, incrementally. So do all of this and uh, adopt these mindsets and I promise you, you will see improved stakeholder engagement, improved satisfaction, and excitement. And I think that basically gives us, uh, takes us to questions and comments. Oh, right away. Yeah, I uh, love the process and I uh, would definitely look forward to implementing something similar where I work, where we have a lot of comparisons to make. Uh, so I work for a CIO who loves tables, so I'm gonna make you go back, or ask you to uh, go back to the, the normalized table. Yeah, there it is. Uh, so a couple clarifications, because I'd probably like to have a similar technique mm -hmm. that you have here. Um, uh, first of all, just for my, my edification, are these real products, or is this just a real are product? These three real products. Oh, so this is just a you know a compare. We had okay. six six project or six SaaS solutions we were looking at. Okay. I didn't want to put all six, so it's just you know do a table of one, two, three, four, five, six, but then also consider doing it yourself if you have the ability to do it yourself. Okay. But we made up these numbers for the purpose of testing. Okay. Yeah. Could, right. Because later you mentioned a real product and I wasn't sure if it was a, a through line from this to a real product. These criteria right. are real for the MTZ project we did. Okay. These numbers are just representative examples. Cool. So if I read this correctly, you get to vendor one has, after the normalization, their score is a good bit higher than the other two, not wildly way out in front. Um, the kind of folks who look at tables and they look for outlier numbers, like yeah. user fit conformity with broader uh, user adoption of technology, better one has a nine and everybody else is way behind. Right. Um, can, you, can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. So, so the, the point we were trying to make there when we were anal analyzing things is uh, there are a couple of different product, products that are really, really complex for an, an actual user at the MTC to use. There's nothing about the interface that is familiar to how they blog on their websites or use social media. It's a very confusing SOP uh, that they would have to follow in order to do anything. So in, the, in this example, vendor one, Super easy to use interface for them. It kind of looks like Drupal, so it was a very high user fit. Use for that second user fit because they're, the other user fit is a rather low score. If you look at uh, user fit in the table, you have a three, three, and a seven, uh, and you look at user fit conformity. Yeah. I, just again to be super clear. I, I, I love the user fit conformity. I think that's an excellent metric. Uh, that's, that's a lot of what service design is about, is to make a complicated experience and turn it into something that people are already familiar with from something possibly unrelated that they do in, in real life. Sure. Uh, like getting through an airport should be easier. It should be more like shopping. Uh, <laughs> you be doing and, that in a few hours. <laughs> uh, no, I, 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 I so, so let me get your, your contact information and um, I can actually send you the real data uh, for this if you want to actually see you know, how things were actually scored. Uh, that'd be awesome. Um, maybe if anyone is interested, uh, just state sort of how you presented it to a client and said this is the one we're going with. Um, basically exactly like this. Uh, except with all the details of all six of these organizations. Sure. And what we presented to the client, you know, we looked more at the original un unnormatized uh, numbers to really discuss one compared to the other. Because in the end, you're going to end up with looking at all these different criteria without sort of standardizing it. It's like apples and oranges and apples and steaks and Rolls Royces and e-bikes. And, you know, so yeah. trying to get to a position of how to actually compare. One might cost twice as much, but it's so much better on user fit that it's worth it. 
That's where the normalization comes into play. Yeah. It may not be, it might be a log logarithmic scale when you're looking at uh, the numbers because some criteria are just so importantly weighted and yeah. a small difference in accessibility creates a greater discrepancy in the numerical scores, yeah. for example. Yeah. Uh, Sorry, next question. How, how did you gain insights on the entire digital ecosystem? Uh, I work, you know, inside a government agency. I don't think anybody at my government agency has a complete picture of that. Yeah, and uh, it was it. Well, we've been working with them for three and a half years, and I think we're there after uh, three and a half years. It's not something that you can just sort of walk in right away. Uh, it takes a lot of conversation, a lot of um, uh, remind figuring out. <coughs> who is the, the person most in charge, and figuring out how to get that conversation to them and explain, because their first question was like, why do you need to know that? Why do you need to know what these other partners are doing? And so it's explaining, well, everything we do is gonna impact them, whether we see it happening right here or right now. A couple of weeks ago, actually, our, our website went down because of some completely unrelated sounding thing that some partners never bothered to even think to tell us. And it's like, guys, come on, you should have known. We would have told you. And so, you know, it, it's just continually having that conversation, continually demonstrating and not only a successful deployment, but you know, why why this mattered for other people to know. When you get that whole picture, how do you express it back to them? Is it a mind map or what do you use? A diagram? A uh, combination of diagrams and a regularly updated uh, set of diagrams of the, the architecture of the system, uh, written documentation. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Map. Org charts, right? You get an org chart, and then if you hear a name that's not on the org chart, then it's like, oh, where do they go? Where's the questions? And another way that we also uncovered some of those stakeholders, uh, at the beginning, uh, as Sean mentioned, the, pro the product we inherited was, was failing. And so there are a number of email chains and alerts and things that go out, or when there's a, like a zero day like Linux thing and they're communicating to everyone, hey, is everyone, is anyone you know, using this system? It, it, things go out really broadly. So you look at like who, who are on those lists and you know, if they're not in your org chart, well, what are they doing? And sometimes you uncover a partner that's like, they're owning a part of the system that you didn't even know did the thing. Yeah. And, and doing that can offer opportunities for agencies to think about consolidation and you identify overlap. Yeah. Yes? It might have been an anecdotal comment, but you had a slide where you were talking about, um, CMS.gov was on the slide, and you were talking about they should use WordPress or Google. Oh, just because CMS.gov? As soon as I heard of it, I'm like, oh, content management system. Oh, yeah. no, you're, I'm from Canada, I didn't realize, but okay. Uh, right. But yeah, CMS is great, but there, there's a woman, I think her name is Andrea Fletcher, uh, who's like the first open source program manager at the federal level. So really, really leading there. Any, any other questions? All right, well, fantastic. So uh, thank you, everyone. Um, also want to point out, if this was of interest to anyone uh, in the project management or program management space, we're hiring. I'm always looking for, for new fun talent. And uh, yeah, please uh, connect with us, uh, connect on LinkedIn, and I can get you guys this slide deck and uh, any other real, you know, yeah, real information that I can provide. We'll post uh, the deck on the session description. Yeah, yeah, that'll work. Or session eyes. Thank you. All right, thanks.